Matthew Mercer, one of the greatest voice actors of all time and the greatest gift to our nerdy community. He's full of heart, charisma, and kindness, except when he's burning him onto the ground. Ah! There's another title that we can give Matt, a lot of us know him by Dungeon Master and one hell of one at that. This guy has done over 100 episodes of Critical Role where he plays D&D with his voice actor buddies that play out for some super interesting role-playing and D&D-ness. Critical Role's got hundreds and thousands of fans and it even blows their minds on the scale that it is today. They play Dungeons and Dragons like a TV show. What a time to be alive! Now, there's a lot I can point out in Critical Role, maybe more in the future. Today, I wanted to focus on one aspect of the game, Matt. You so fucking Precious when you smile. Matthew Mercer, in my opinion, is a shining example of what it means to be a good dungeon master. In the DM's guide where it talks about being a DM, there should just be a picture of Matt and a big arrow that says, hey, watch this guy, he does it perfectly. What? There's no way one guy can be that good of a DM, right? He has to slip up every once in a while. And isn't it a little presumptuous to think that the DM for a D&D show is a good example? It's not a real game. I used to think this, actually. When I first heard of Critical Role and was watching it all along with other live D&D games, I liked them, but I always assumed that they were overproduced D&D shows, meaning that it was more about entertaining an audience rather than actually playing the game which goes pretty true for some D&D shows, but I threw Critical Role in that pile because voice actors, good cameras, mics, and a damn good game. There has to be a script in there, right? Or producers? There's no way this is legit D&D. &D. Then I did my research. These are legit nerdy ass voice actors who like to play D&D &D, and when they do, it's hella entertaining. I would legitimately think their home game is just as interesting as the show. Maybe with a little less cheering and announcements and format. So how the hell is this guy so good at being a dungeon master? Why do his players listen in on every word? Why do they get so invested? How does he do those voices and descriptions? Yes, uh, um... Happy to help you. <laughs> well, let's find out. Let's dive into Matt's brain and find out how he makes his game so good for us and his players. Oh, hey, also light spoilers for both campaigns. Ever since three years ago when they switched from Pathfinder to 5th edition, Matt has known near down to every rule in the game. 14 points of damage, of piercing damage. 14 points of piercing damage, and he gets shoved off the back of the roof. He's gonna make an acrobatics check, which he succeeds. So he lands down there, he only takes uh, one point of damage from the fall. There's some times when he slips up, or needs to check the book every once in a while, but he is the master of rules, and he takes it very seriously. He knows all the player abilities, maybe not every spell how their abilities work, how they affect him. Not only does this make the game run smoothly, it also gives the players an amount of respect towards him because he's the master of the rules. Even sometimes when his players get a little rule lawyery or question when something doesn't happen even though the rules say so, he's very quick to shut it down and continue with the game simply stating, hey, this is how it is. Plus this, 11. So wait, is this with your, did you click your boots of haste on this? No, so two attacks. You get two attacks, but you used your bonus action to disengage, which would have been your second attack. So you oh, then I'm out. Yeah. All right, then I'm out. I also really have to commend Travis, Marisha, Liam, Sam, Laura, Tallison, and Ashley because they are pretty respectable when it comes to his decisions, which I have to assume is something he's talked about with them out of game and blah, 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 blah. Regardless, Matt knows the rules. He wants to know it better than his players so that they can trust him. And that's a really good trait to have as a dungeon master. I think this is something pretty uncommon in the D&D world that a lot more dungeon masters need to pick up on. Matt narrates every bit of the game he can. Almost like reddish white hot, this <laughs> cascading through the air, <laughs> plunges into the side of the ogre's shoulder, <laughs> with a smattering of blood splattering against the cave behind it. It's actually moved back a step and has to catch itself. <laughs> 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 Slams his club into the ground. Yes, he's doing it for entertainment value, but there is something special about it. Even if he's fumbling over words. Almost like a, a, a toothy moss. Toothy moss. Toothy moss. Toothy moss. Toothy moss. Trust me, I do it too. He still does his best to make everything feel like it's actually happening. Watch when he describes how enemies die, the brutality of it, and how Laura and Marisha squeam almost every time. As you grind down to the surface, you can see it. It's it's uh, armored back just pop open, like a freshly cooked sausage. Just the inside uh. just <laughs> spill out onto the ground. By the time Grog reaches the ground, you are coated 
in, in thick, thick crimson. It feels real to them. Those responses aren't disingenuine. He's just really good at this. The important detail here is not that Matt is a good describer, it's that he makes the characters look awesome or stupid. Even if it's as simple as Bo throwing ball bearings on the cave floor, he still makes it look and sound awesome like it's a part of the game. You hear what sounds like hundreds of tiny metal clanks in succession <laughs> as ball bearings begin to spray down the stairs and scattering across the floor of the central makeshift ritual room. Describing every inch of her action, making her feel cool for doing something seemingly not that important. Later on, Sam's character Not decides to stab the bad guy's baby and Matt describes it. As you plunge the, your short sword down into the the mewling, eye-covered cub, oh, it goes no. still as the mother manticore flying up in the air turns around oh, and watches this and just gives a <laughs> Hitting an enemy, Matt describes it. You watch as the blast hits into the side of this arm. The arm actually uh, over hyper extends what? and part of the bone oh. shoots out this side. And he goes casting a spell. Matt describes it. Okay, so a, a large, sword. great hand sword, almost a light reflection, mirror image of the craven edge that nearly tore the soul from your friend. Oh, the giant uh, one. A, a, a large oh, yeah, light beautiful. blade of Saren Ray's wrath just emerges out of the stonework in the center of the square. <gasps> Floats in the air for a second. Looking out a window, Matt describes it. You look about the sky, it is clear. Uh, the dark clouds that had loomed towards the top of Gat Shadow have since blown away. Uh, the starry night sky now spreads infinitely above you. And for the first time in a long time, knowing that the immediate danger is no longer chasing you, you take a minute to appreciate the sheer beauty of the view that Western always had. And you know what this does to your players? It does this. And damage? How do you want to do that? Yeah! Yes! Yes! <laughs> when you are amping up your players and describing their actions in front of them, it makes them feel awesome. It makes them feel like they are changing the world that you are actively making. Nobody wants to come play D&D. Write up your character and how cool they are with their great backstory and all the ideas you've put into them, only for the dungeon master to describe how awesome his NPCs are and never touch your character in the sight of the narrative. Even if you're one of those hard-ass DMs who wants the players to describe their actions instead of you doing it, it still feels pretty lame. If you're the person who's telling me what the world is and what's happening and you just leave my character out of all those descriptions, it makes me feel like I'm not really there. Matt throws that on its backside and makes players feel awesome when they succeed. He narrates their menial tasks to make it something interesting. He also makes their failures hilarious. Everything that the characters do is important to him and it's important to the world. He makes them the stars of the story. This in turn keeps his players attentive. His players care about the things he describes, even when it's not them. They hang on to all of his NPCs, all of his words, everything he describes, because it's very important. Because if you miss something, then you've missed something, and that's bad. Everything that comes out of Matt's mouth is important to the game. On top of that, he also makes every description and everything really epic and unique because he's a really good writer, but we'll get to that next. Matt spends his time putting charm and character into his world. Every corner of the world has some sort of personality, whether it's bandits trying to rob the party. Wait, I have a car. I thought you had the car if you were gonna load our stuff onto your cart. Uh, no, we were taking your car. Oh, uh, well, where'd you come from? That's so stupid. This is a really terrible plan. Uh, also, but we steal your car and we get your stuff from, just shut up! It's like, I'm sorry. Random NPCs, Oh, yeah, yes, yes, no, Sutter Peak, it's not too far from Vasselheim. Uh, it's about a uh, two days travel on horseback, uh, southwest. Uh, the, the Sutter Peak Mountains themselves, uh, be careful. They're, uh, they're pretty steep. Um, <laughs> I haven't actually gone within the mountain range myself, but I've been within a few miles of it just to make sure that I can mark it with on my map. But, uh, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, it, it should be fine. <laughs> um, Matt takes extra time to make them a little bit more quirky than the average D&D &D game. Why does he do this? One. His players are super interested in each character. Every time Matt plays something, we all know there's gonna be something special with this guy. Two, like we discussed before, because his players feel super immersed when playing, these NPCs actively respond and comment on the players. No, they don't bow down to their every whim, but Matt takes time to make sure that introductions are in order. The creepy character is creepy. The noble character is noble. What powers do you see? What powers can you do? 
Should I, I asked my question first. <laughs> <laughs> so creepy. However, it's still up to interpretation on the players and how they see each character. Matt also does this amazing thing that I really need all of you DMs to hear me out on. A simple little trick that will make buying things way more fun in your game. Stop making mean merchants. It might just be a personal pet peeve thing for me. I really hate merchants that are just mean because I just don't get along with them. Take it from Matt himself. From Gilmore. Swishes open, he goes, I'm sorry, was I being summoned? <laughs> yes. He immediately looks at Yes. <laughs> oh. Oh. You've returned. To Pumat Soul. With what I have. Let me go ahead and have a look at it, if you wouldn't mind just. There we go. That's uh, there's a few other pieces right there. You just oh, want to hand just, those over? They're not really think. attached. I'm no, sorry. Yeah. All right. That, oh, that's I a don't know if set. the shells fall out, so just be careful. His players love his merchants. And they kind of need to! Wouldn't it be far more fun to A, make an interesting, quirky, fun merchant character that the players can return to in order to bring business to them so they can get things and there's an equal amount of trade going on, rather than B, grumpy old dwarf number 16 who has take it or leave it attitude and steeps up price because he's the only blacksmith in town. Even Matt's blacksmiths are interesting. Ting! Turn. I take my pink bag, put it down on the table in front of him. Oh, um, <clears throat> I like. Well, it's hard to do that. Making interesting NPCs requires hard work and natural talent that I don't have. You can do it, I promise. Open this page to the Dungeon Master's Guide and make a cool, interesting dude for your players to interact with. Get a piece of paper and write down a bunch of pre-made NPCs for your game if you can't come up with them on the spot. It's not a difficult thing to do and I feel like it really will enhance your game. It does for Matt, at least. But I swear, they will eat it up and enjoy your game way more. Matt involves the characters not only in the game, but a part of the story as well. He ensures to know backstories, character motivations, and their traits in order to get them to do things. He brings in old people from their backstory. He ensures to let personal character stuff happen. Hey, I want the next arc of my game to be really motivating, and I want the characters to hate my villain. How should I do it? Hmm. Oh, what's the most precious thing to them? Their home? Burn it! Matt does an exceptional job at keeping his players motivated. They all have reason to do what they are doing and complete the task at hand, all because of something really, really simple. He actually cares about the people who play his game and their characters. This is not a hard thing to understand, and I feel like it's often overlooked. I do it too. I tend to just see the characters as just the people playing my video game, and I put more attentiveness into my world than at my characters. There's an interweave between the two of them, and I think to give your players motivation, you need to sit down with the people who are playing those characters and understand this character that they're about to play. It will make them feel far more immersed in the game, and they'll be be much more attentive to whatever you do when you kind of make the world revolve around them for a little bit. Just for a little bit, you don't have to do it for that long, but make them feel special. I think that's really important. Matt has a lot of heart. You can truly tell he loves what he is doing. He puts his heart and soul into every character of his game. You feel the emotion behind a man who's lost everything. Uh, of the inn, a single halfling man kind of sifts through the wreckage, a crown's guard helping him lift heavier beams, and you see as he plucks what he can of his former life from the rubble. And then he points over to the rubble, and you can see what looks to be a skeletal body that's kind of been partially collapsed. Uh, I suppose, um, I suppose Lehman's probably not going to be a regular anymore. Um, you learn to hate those who take advantage of others. Okay, I just walk away. <laughs> yeah. As you walk away, he goes, Yeah, that's what I thought. Cat kicker. <laughs> Quick meeting, right? Cat kicker. Quick fucking meeting. Oh, kill that guy. What a dick. Kill that guy. Oh, jeez. You just made some guard tonight. You pity certain villains. I left my pursuit of base interests and began to obsess over a cure for this before it took me. I burned through servant after servant to find anything on such a disease. Everything failed. Everything. Do you cry when characters die? Matt has likely got the most one-of-a-kind notes behind his screen. He plays Dungeons and Dragons for the narrative. It's about the story he creates with his friends. 
which is why I think Critical Role is such a huge success. These guys aren't trying to bank D&D for some cash or boost Wizards of the Coast. They are literally doing this because they enjoy it. And I think that's such a great motivation for people and a reason why so many of us have our heart in this show and the characters and the people and why we cry when things happen. We enjoy it with them. Critical Role is a gem filled with heart, which I think a lot of us need sometimes to turn off the outside world, sit down, and have fun with our friends, which is what I think Dungeons & Dragons is all about. Thank you, Matt Mercer. Thank you for that.